door. Ten, nine, ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, six, two, one, zero. Lift off. 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 Lift Tower. Welcome to the Alien Probe Podcast. It is Sunday, November 26, 2023. I'm Doug. Joining me today is Deb. What's going on, Deb? It's evening. Oh, well, we're okay. not used to doing this in the evening. We didn't do it in the morning because I wasn't ready. I cleaned the garage yesterday, so I couldn't. You, you had couldn't to do get chores. Ready. I had I'm to sorry. do some chores. <laughs> I'm sorry, you poor our thing. Dog, our dog's still in rehab. He'll be in rehab for three months. Yeah, so it's freezing cold outside, and you get to take him outside on a leash. Yeah, he pee and poop. He doesn't like to go to the bathroom on the leash, so we mm-hmm. let let him. We're not supposed to have him off the leash, but we have to cheat because. He gets to he gets Max does not like to go to the bathroom on leash. <laughs> okay. So that's the dog corner. Yeah, the, the dogs. Yeah. We're kind of, we're in our uh, third install third install third installment of uh Flying Saucers have landed by um Desmond Leslie and Georgia Damsky. Um it was a 1953 book. We're kind of, we're kind of doing an overview on that. Checking it out, see, and uh, we're a lot of excerpts from it. You know, it's a really interesting book. Um, we're at the point now. We won't rehab, rehab. We won't rehab. We won't rehash what we did uh, again. Yeah, nobody wants to. Hear other that again. podcasts do that. They talk for half the podcast about what they talked about. We're not going to. Yeah, do nobody that. wants to hear it. You may see it on YouTube. Like and subscribe, Alien Pro Podcast, and all plot podcast platforms. You'll see episodes one and two, or listen to, and. You can get caught up if you're just joining us. I love the way they spell color. Okay, so um, we're starting out. We're continuing on uh, with some events that happened uh, right now at the end of the 1800s. We'll roll. We're not going to just kind of, this is this will wrap up in a little bit. Then it'll roll through some examples. And um, it's pretty interesting. And again, the reason I do this is that um, with the events that are happening now, and everybody knows about Grush and what's going on with the Senate and the House and um, the infighting that's going on there. And um, I, I think people should know what the history of all this is or what, what the rest of us have been looking at while other people are new to this, you know. So um, without further ado, um, we're going to begin in uh, 1899, November 15th. An enormous star or disc over the, oh, those more fancy words, <laughs> Dordogne, France, changing color, red and white, red, white, then blue, moves majestically and sails away. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of the night. I guess we couldn't have finished this. We the couldn't end have of the done night. one more sentence. We couldn't have done one more. I think that was all we had in us. But anyway, and that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of the 19th century gallery. Before entering the Edwardian Hall, you may sit down and rest your feet while the guide says a few words. Okay, that'll be me. Yeah. Forgive him if he points out that all these objects seen, seen tally in every respect with the things we make so much fuss about today and call flying saucers, which brings us to the conclusion that saucers are not a new phenomenon. All that is new is our improved method of transmitting news. We get quicker, better reports, and more of them, which is, you know, the same today. Yeah, and as these things, as we get later and later and, and closer and closer to present day, we're not going to, obviously, this was done in 53. They don't even go to 1953. They wrap it up um, into the 1900s. But you can tell that there's more reports, and uh, the reports are more detailed than they were in the 1600s, <laughs> you know, where those were written down. The Vatican, I don't know. Uh, 1901, April 4th, Persian Gulf, revolving luminous wheels seen near the surface by the ship Kilwa. That'd be kind of interesting. Yeah, May 10th, 1902, South Devon, large number of highly colored objects like small suns reported by Colonel Markwick. 
1904, on February 24th, the SS Supply sighted three luminous disks four times the sun's area. They flew in accurate formation, first below some clouds estimated at 5,000 feet. Later, they rose into the cloud layer and disappeared. That's an interesting ship name. I wonder what it does. The SS Supply. <laughs> It's a cruise ship. It's boring. 1905, September 2nd. Langollen, North Wales. Intensely dark object flying at an estimated height of two miles. 10,000 feet. Hey. 1905, March 29th. In Cardiff, Wales, a vertical tube of light appears in the sky. Like an iron bar heated to orange. An orange colored glow, say witnesses. In 1905, on April 1st, in Cherbourg, France, a glowing disc with a corona seen over the town several nights in succession. February 1 of 1905, the Daily Mail reports a brilliant disc over Wales, which hung motionless for a time and later moved off. I got a dog in my lap here. Yeah. Into 1906, on June 2nd, the Gulf of Oman, revolving spokes of light seen on water near a ship, reports Mr. Carnegie of Blackheath, Kent. 1907, March 14th, Malacca Strait. Shafts which seem to move round center like spokes of a wheel about 300 yards long, reports the P&O SS Orient. Hmm. Interesting, the wheel things. Yeah, it's like Ezekiel's wheel. Is, is, you read the Bible? Ezekiel's Not wheel? No, yeah. don't know that. Not recently. <laughs> what are you reading? Crap. Yeah, I read trash. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've read some of that stuff. I'm, I'm reading something from Oprah's Book Club right now. Oh. In July 2nd of 1907 in Burlington, Vermont, a huge dark torpedo hovers over the city. From holes down its side issue tongues of fire and shooting sparks. Oh, this sounds a like tongue of fire. Tongues of fire. It is first seen stationary over College and Church streets following a loud report. Then the flames brighten and it moves off. A small luminous disc is seen to detach itself from the parent craft and disappear. Oh, wow, it's a mothership. That one is very... Yeah, it's interesting. Very different from the rest of them that we've heard. 1908, on May 1st, Fittel, France. A luminous disc as large as the moon appears. It has a coronal band around it. After some time, a black band appears obliquely across the disc. Wow. That's it's interesting. March 11, 1909, Peterborough, England, noisy object carrying light moves over the town. There's a police report. And May on May 18th, we're still in 1909. I think we're going to yeah. be there a while. Yeah. Um, carefully Wales, a Cardiff man named Lithbridge says he was walking through the mountains when he came across a large cylindrical construction parked beside a lonely road. Inside it, he saw two peculiar... Oh, this one gets good. He saw two peculiar-looking men dressed in some kind of fur coats. <laughs> fur coats. On seeing it, him, yeah. they gabbled excitedly in a foreign language. <laughs> the next minute, the machine rose in the air and flew away. It had no wings and made little noise. A depression was found in the grass at the place he indicated. The first report in this century of one of these things seen on the ground. See, this is where I'm going with the extra tempestual thing. So that's somebody from the future. Yeah, because they're they're in the future. They said, "Well, we got to dress, you know, like Star Trek. They have to dress like the time." Yeah, wonder what kind of you fur they're wearing. <laughs> or if Israel was in 1909, June 10th, the Strait of Malacca, another okay. luminous revolving wheel seen on the water. Also in 19, we got another couple from 1909, September 8th, luminous object crosses New England with noise of machinery. And on August, excuse me, October 31st, searchlight stabs down from the sky over Bridgewater, New England, then flashes up again. It's kind of mm -hmm. like Deadwood where they... You just put lights down on you. It's like, they, they talk like Deadwood, but they're making the most simple, the most simple sentence. Is that how they talk then? I seriously doubt it, <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> but especially not the um, the cursing. Yeah, well, that's yeah, that's interesting. On December twentieth, again, nineteen oh nine, luminous object seen over Boston, Massachusetts. On December twenty third, 
It is seen over Worcestershire, Massachusetts, sweeping the heavens with a searchlight of tremendous power. Two hours later, it returns and is seen by thousands in the street. It hovers, heads south, then moves off east to the sea. To the sea, to the sea. To the sea. I should mention that I've got a Damsky, right? That's that's Georgia Damsky's picture right there. I didn't actually explain that also. But we got George there, and he's uh, going through one of his diagrams. It's in a magazine, it looks like. Very sharp-dressed man there. He's, you know, that's how they, you know, you were talking about where your dad, when he had the shirt and mm-hmm. his cigarettes. He's got a cigarette, that is, he's got a cigarette in there. It just reminds me of Polly Walnuts from Polly the Walnuts. Sopranos. <laughs> December 24th, 1909, it comes back to Boston. Oh, they're thinking it's the same thing. Many reports in 1909. December 24th, Limerick, Ireland. Luminous disc seen over northeast horizon. Moving slowly southwards, turning about and moving off in the opposite direction. Visible 32 minutes. On December 31st of 1909, Huntington, West Virginia, three huge luminous discs of equal size appear in the early morning sky. August 12th of 1910, in the South China Sea, a Dutch, the Dutch steamer Valentine, horizontal glowing wheel turning rapidly just above the water. On January 13th of 1910, in Chattanooga, Tennessee, for the third day running a mysterious white, oh, the, for the third day running, a mysterious white aircraft passed over Chattanooga about noon today. It came from the north and was traveling southeast. On Wednesday, it came south, and on Thursday, it returned north. This thing gets around. Yeah. The longest dirigible flight then recorded was from St. Cyr to the Eiffel Tower, which was just a few miles. Oh, interesting. I wonder what was going on in 1909, 1910. It's crazy out there. When did they invent cocaine? <laughs> <laughs> 1912, January 27th, a Dr. Harris observes a dark bird-shaped object poised oh. over the moon. Estimated to be 250 miles long, at least. At least. 1912, March 6th, warmly near Bristol, England. A splendidly illuminated object travels slowly towards Gloucester. Tremendous, like a triple-headed fireball, says breathtaking spectators. Holy crap. Wow. I want to see the bird over the moon. Um, April 8th of 1912, in Tisbury, Wilts, England, clouds moving rapidly. Well, that happens, people. Yeah. Two stationary dark shadows on the clouds. The clouds scamper on, but the two dark patches remain still for an, half an hour. Wow. Scampering clouds. Yeah, then in 1913, January 4th, Dover, England. Unknown airship with lights. 1913, January 11th, Cardiff, Wales. Huge airship leaving dense smoke trails seen by Chief Constable Glad Morganshire. Yeah, get that one out. <laughs> Whoa. What, the, I, I'm not with the smoke trail thing. I, I don't know why there would be a smoke trail. I mean, you know, it sounds like one of those, you know, movies, you mm-hmm. know, one of those old movies where they got the spaceship and it's got just billowing. So, of course, our spaceship still billow smoke. But 1913, January 24th, totter down near Bristol, sweeping brilliant lights pouring down from the sky, illuminating. Distant hills. On January 31st of 1913, an aerial tube with sweeping lights over many parts of South Wales. On January 28th, a lighted airship was seen over Liverpool. Liverpool. Hmm. On on February 5th, in Dowlay Valley, South Wales, something. You're not telling me what Nothing happened then. They just uh, just wanted to get in there. I guess. Of a record. 1914, August 13th, nine days after the outbreak of the Great War. Horrible bunching, dumbbell-like things seen over Elstree Hertz. 1914, October 10th, a couple months later, a black torpedo crosses the sun. Reported as an extraordinary clear-cut, surrounded by corona or hail, like a ship throwing up white foamed waves. 1914, October 10th, a black torpedo crosses the sun. Well, that's that's weird. It yeah. repeated itself. Yeah. We'll move on to 1915. <laughs> on July 31st, Balansolo, Ireland, a large luminous body moving northwest, remaining stationary for 45 minutes, 
Moving off and disappearing five hours after it first appeared, Venus was once again near to the Earth. Yeah, that Venus, it's, that's one you have to be careful of Venus. I've had Venus and Jupiter. Remember, you came in the other night and said, oh, that's kind of weird. It looks mm -hmm. like a Google. Yep. Yeah, luckily, we got that. Uh, what's that? The app. with the, the I app. forget what it's called. but And you just put it up in the sky and it, it tells you what it is. On July 19th. Huntington, West Virginia, 1915, Huntington, West Virginia. Luminous cigar-shaped object or formation. On August 20th, 1917, luminous disks in crossing the moon. Wow. In 1923, oh, we skipped some time there. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're just, you know, in not North, looking up as much. In North Carolina, people got busy. <laughs> in North Carolina, reports of brilliant spheres or disks appearing from time to time during the three years moving in leisurely formation or singly in the neighborhood of the Brown Mountains. Much talk. Official in investigation draws a blank. Don't wow. you hate that? I do hate that. Now we're up to 1929, August 29th. 400 miles off the Virginia coast. Luminous body traveling at 100 miles per hour. Seen by the steamship Coldwater. Another fantastic name for his... Mm -hmm. We want to name the ship. How about cold water? Yeah, it goes in the cold water. No, <laughs> no Atlantic flights at the time. At that time. Enough, enough. Our feet are weary. The museum guide is hoarse. Oh. How much farther do you want us to walk? How many more saucers are you going to give us? Must we continue right up to the present day until no. our eyes grow dim from looking in the sky? No. I don't think we want to go do this until the present day, which would be 1953. Oh, my Lord. So they went to 1929. There's going to be, and then um, there will be other examples and then some, some um, explanation of what these things might be. Okay, to which I answer, if you are by now convinced to your own satisfaction, not mine, you're supposed to read these this in a certain way. Like what way? <laughs> I don't know what his accent sounds like. Oh, okay. <laughs> the flying saucers have been visiting our planet for the past three centuries, and that few of them can be explained as weather balloons, secret weapons, illusions, meteors, ionized air, and the rest. Then by all means, turn to chapter six and read on from there. But if you believe... If you believe... Like Dr. Donald Menzel of Harvard... Oh, excuse me, Harvard, Harvard Observatory, that all these things can be readily explained within our own atmosphere, then I shall drive you ruthlessly on to the bitter end. However, we shall not bother with Dr. Menzel for the moment, but shall concern ourselves with some other scientists who, like Men unlike Menzel, have not written a book to prove that flying saucers are the result of human ignorance in misinterpreting ordinary phenomena. An incident one at 9.10 p.m., August 25th, 1951, Dr. W.I. Robinson, professor, professor of geology at the Texas, Texas Technological College, stood in the backyard of his home in Lubbock, Texas, and chatted with two colleagues. The other men were Dr. A.G. Oberg, a professor of chemical engineering, and Professor W.L. Ducker, Head of the Department of Petroleum Engineering. What happens to these names? You never really hear them anymore. I know. I've you never know. heard of Ducker. It's like the names kind of, we meet, we invented new names or, you know. It's kind of funny because it all started with one name. So how did we end up with so many new names because it's the same people? How did we get to Brittany? <laughs> no, that's the first name. I'm talking about oh, like the people's last names. Last name. Well, it used to be whatever you did. You oh, know, really? If you were a carpenter, your last name was Carpenter. You know, that that's how, you know, the beginning of names was, you know, people just took the name of the profession that they did. But, you know, then people came through Ellis Island and got handed names, you know, oh, and, and there were places where, you know, names got shortened and changed. And I'm sure there's a quite a fascinating history to how well, then, names have evolved. Yeah, and you don't necessarily need to take, as we know, with people we do know right now, you don't take the name the kid gets born it gets another name even though it's the yeah that's very unusual yeah the night was clear and dark suddenly all three men saw a number of lights race noiselessly across the sky 
from horizon to horizon in a few seconds. They gave the impression of about 30 luminous beads arranged in a crescent shape. A few moments later, another similar formation flashed across the night. It's a good thing I had the end of that Starbucks today. Mm -hmm. What do you think? This time, the scientists were able to judge that the lights moved through 30 degrees of arc in a second. A check the next day with the Air Force showed that no planes had been over the area at the time. This was but the beginning. Professor Ducker observed 12 flights of the luminous objects between August and November of last, of last year. Some of his colleagues observed as many as 10. Hundreds of non-scientific observers in a wide vicinity around Lubbock have seen as many as three flights of the mysterious crescents in one night. Wow. Can you hear that the neighbors are out raking in the dark? They're what? Raking. Oh, really? I'm sure the leaf blower will be out any minute. <laughs> On the night of August 30th, an attempt to photograph the lights was made by 18-year-old Carl Hart Jr. He uses a Kodak 35mm camera at... F3.5, one-tenth of a second. Thank you. Working rapidly, Hart managed to get five exposures of the flights. One of the pictures exhibited by Hart as a result of this effort shows 18 to 20 luminous objects more intense than the planet Venus arranged in one or a pair of crescents. In several photographs off to one side of the main flight, a larger luminosity is visible, like a mother craft hovering near its aerial brood. You know, this is the problem with today with CGI. Mm. I mean, now it's like, what's real? What well, You can even make something look old. Yes, we can do anything. You know, now we can do anything. So every picture that comes out, you're kind of you're saying, I've got a lot of pictures that I pick up or people send me. So I put it on. We have the Alien Pro Podcast Facebook. Um, so if you're on Facebook, you know, you can friend us and you can see all these crazy things that get dredged that some most of them we know are cgi they're yeah, just big, you know they're not gonna they're just now cool. on facebook half the pictures that you're seeing are ai there's yeah. they're making all these dogs and cats and people and yeah they're making like the people are fake they have the fake it's in their profile and it's a fake a cgi picture of themselves yeah and then you know it's like uh, it's, it's just so as these things come forward i don't know what we're going to get with is this a real picture or what? Nobody's going to believe anything anymore. Yeah. Well, I like the comics, though. I get a lot. The comic you sent me has yeah, got the, a lot of... The comics are fun. You know, about the uh, the guy with the, um, the leaf, leaf blower. blower. Okay. The, the, the alien didn't like the sound. So <sighs> come, come on to our Facebook and check it out. Um, so the evaluation of the last, the above uh, um, observation, the observations, of, this is the evaluation of what we just talked about. The observations have been too numerous and too similar to be doubted. In addition, the Air Force, after the closest examination, has found nothing fraudulent about Hart's pictures. The lights are much too bright to be reflections and therefore must be the bodies containing sources of light. Wow. Since professors Ducker, Oberg, and Robinson could not measure the size and distance of the formations, they could form no precise estimate of their speed. However, they calculated if the lights were flying at an altitude of 5,000 feet, they must have been traveling about 1,800 miles an hour. That's fast. But, but the professors, along with other scientists, agree that in order to explain the silence of the objects, it must be assumed that they were at at least 50,000 feet in the air. In which case they were going not 1,800 miles an hour, but 18,000 wow, miles per hour. Wow, that's fast. Similar lines of light were seen in the skies of ancient Persia, usually before some natu national ca catastrophe. I think it's natural catastrophe. This is national catastrophe. Oh. Maybe it's natural. Uh -huh. So that they became omens of disaster. Omens. The omens. Incident number two. On July 10th, 1947, at 4.47 p.m. That's what happened in 49, What happened in July of 47, Deb? Do you know? Do I? Ro do you know what happened? No. Roswell. Oh, okay. But we this got... right in there. On 7, 7 of 47, at 4.47, that's a lot of sevens, one of the United States' top astronomers was driving from Clovis to Klein's Corner, New Mexico. His wife and his teenage daughters were also in the car. 
for professional reasons, he had asked life to withhold his identity. It was a bright, sunny day, but the whole western half of the sky was a confused cloud sea. All at once, all at once. as the car headed towards these clouds, all four of us almost simultaneously became aware of a curious bright object almost motionless among the clouds. She'd been looking at the road. Instantly, from yeah. long habit in dealing with... You didn't have a phone to look at. You gotta look at something. I know. <laughs> Let's look at the sky. From long habit in dealing with celestial phenomena, he began to make calculations with what crude materials he had at hand. He held a pencil at arm's length, measured the size of the object against the windshield of the car, measured the distance between his eyes and the windshield, etc. His wife and two daughters did the same, each making independent calculations. They all had a pencil? They all... <laughs> Well, he's, isn't he a professor? Oh, okay. pro, you know, Everybody's it's required. Got Everybody's, so. yeah, and, and a slide rule. Slide rule. <laughs> Horn rim glasses. <laughs> the object, says the scientist, showed a sharp and firm regular outline, namely one of a smooth elliptical character, much harder and sharper than the edges of the cloudlets. The hue of the luminous object was somewhat less white than the light of the Jupiter on the dark day, not aluminum or silver colored. The object clearly exhibited a sort of wobbling motion. That's kind of like the, um, when these things are crashing, they kind of make a, they kind of go like this, like a leaf falling yeah. from a tree. So if you see a UFO that's doing that, kind He's of look pretty, out, it's probably going to crash. crash. All right, I'll remember that. This wobbling motion <laughs> served to set off the object as a rigid, if not solid body. Do you look up in the sky and look for ufos no but i look around i'm not looking for ufos <laughs> sometimes i look up and see the birds you're not a member of the tinfoil hat club uh, no so i'm not looking for ufos and if i see one i'm not going to be happy <laughs> after 30 seconds in plain view why wouldn't you be happy because it'll scare me <laughs> i'm looking for birds not, <laughs> not blind saucers. God. <laughs> after 30 seconds in plain view the ellipsoid moved slowly behind a cloud Really? 273 azimuth elevation 1%? I don't know what the hell that means. And we thought we had lost it. But approximately five seconds later, it reappeared at 275. Oh, wait. So and what it's saying, it's two degrees higher and one degree. Okay. Or one degree in elevation and two degrees in azimuth. Okay. So like this. Okay, it moved. This remarkably <laughs> sudden ascent Very slightly, though. <laughs> thoroughly convinced me that we were dealing with an absolutely novel airborne device yeah that's just novel Ab after reappearing the object moved slowly from south to north across the clouds as seen projected against these dark clouds the object gave the strongest impression of self-luminosity <laughs> that's a great band name too about two and a half minutes after it came into view, the thing disappeared finally behind a cloud bank. Wow. Finally, did that be you? Finally disappeared because I didn't want to see so it. I will see that. <laughs> um, evaluation. The astronomer, astronomer vouches for the approximate accuracy of his observations and computations. He determined that the object was not less than 20 nor more than 30 miles from his viewing point. That it was ellipsoidal. That sounds... That's Sounds it. like a Three Stooges thing, ellipsoidal, and rigid, that it was 160 feet long, 65 feet thick, if seen at minimum distance, or 245 feet long and 100 feet thick if at maximum. That's that big. its horizontal speed <laughs> ranged between 120 and 180 miles per hour, and its vertical rise between 600 and 900. So it went at miles per hour, so it went up really fast. Yeah. Okay. And it went like, yeah, yeah, hella quick. <laughs> he also observed that the object moved with a wobble, no sound, and left no exhaust or vapor trail. His wife and daughter supported his observations. The object's appearance and behavior answered to that of no known optical or celestial phenomenon. No known projected aircraft, rocket, or guided missile can make such a rapid vertical ascent without leaving an exhaust or vapor trail. Well, yeah, anything earthly. Yes. Incident number three. On April 24th of 1949 at 1020 a.m., a group of five technicians under the general supervision of J. Gordon Vaith 
an aeronautical engineer employed by the Office of Naval Research, were preparing to launch a skyhook balloon near Array, New Mexico. You can see how these differ from the 1600 reports. Yes. A small... Um, <laughs> we got a dog? Yeah. A small balloon was uh, sent up first to check the weather. Oh, no, not a weather balloon. Is this 47? <laughs> Charles yep. B. Moore, an aerialist. Of General Mills, is <laughs> that cereal company? No, they're pioneers in cosmic ray research. Wow. Was tracing the weather balloon through the theodolite, a 25-power telescope instrument which gives degrees of azimuth and elevation, horizontal and vertical position, for any object it is sighted in on. At 10.30 a.m., more lean back from the theodolite. Th th <laughs> I don't like that word. To, to glance at the balloon with his naked eye. Suddenly he saw a whitish elliptical object, apparently much higher than the balloon and moving in the opposite direction. At once. At once. Right he now. He picked the object up with theodolite at 45 degrees of elevation and 210 degrees of azimuth. I'm going to get one of those. <laughs> and tracked it, it east at the phenomenal rate of four degrees of azimuth change per second as it drops swiftly to an elevation of 25 degrees. The object appeared to be an ellipsoid roughly two and a half times long as it was doing? wide. <laughs> Suddenly, it swung abruptly upward and rushed out of sight in a few seconds. Moore had tracked it for about 30 seconds altogether. The, no, the other members of his crew confirmed this report no sound was heard. No vapor vapor trail was seen. The object, according to rough estimations by Moore and his colleagues, was about 56 miles above the Earth, 100 feet long, and was traveling at 7 miles per second. In evaluation. How, how many miles an hour is that, Deb? A lot. <laughs> no known optical or atmospheric phenomenon fits these facts. No natural object tra traveling at seven miles per second has ever been seen to make a sudden upward turn. Happens all the time these days, for some reason. <laughs> there is no known or projected source of silent, vaporless power for such a machine. No human being could have borne the tremendous G-load brought to bear on the craft during its abrupt vertical veer. That's the problem. That's the, the problem yeah. we run into. Snap your little neck. Well, it probably has some sort of a sort of a word. The the theory, not my mm -hmm. theory, because I'm not a scientist, but uh, it has some sort of inertial dampener, kind of like Star Trek. Yeah. You know, when they're at warp speed, and they don't get slammed against the. You know, right. it's, there's a field, of uh, some sort of electromagnetic field or something. I don't know if it's electromagnetic, which prevents the the G load from having okay. an effect of the people on the inside. You're rocking. No. You're being you're being very active. You're gonna give somebody seasick. <laughs> Incident number four. Are they still around by this? Oh, probably not now. Thirty two minutes. No, nah, nobody's <laughs> nobody's nobody lasts this long. Incident, it's a good thing this is a hobby. Incident number four on May 29th. I need you to move the screen okay. a little bit. Nineteen fifty one at three forty eight PM, three technical writers for the Aerophysics Department of North American Aviation's plant at Downey outside Los Angeles were chatting on the factory grounds. Just yeah. chatting as guys yeah. do. They were Victor Black, Werner Eichler, and Ed J. Sullivan. Ed Sullivan? A different Ed. <laughs> oh, oh, Pretty okay. sure. You don't know that. Okay. All at once they stared at the sky. Sullivan describes what they saw. Have a good shoe. Oh no, he didn't say that. Uh, approximately 30 glowing meteor-like objects sprayed out of... Sprayed? It's just... Out of the east at a point about 45 degrees above the horizon. Executed a right angle turn and swept across the sky in an undulating vertical formation that resembled a tuning fork on edge. See, at this point, I, my ass would be in the building. No, I have No, you keep your eyes on it. No, I'm out, man. I'm what do you think? You're getting too cover. much Independence Day for you? I'm running for cover. Or too huh? much uh, Cowboys and Aliens? Yeah, I'm not. Or, I'm not I'm, I think Cowboys and Aliens probably worse for you. You stand out there and look, oh, look, they're going to hit us. Oh. Or, I haven't think they've landed on anybody yet. They yeah. just kind of, you know, it's worse. They might fly over you and beam you up. No, I don't want Maybe that. Maybe do either. some examinations. No, I don't want to meet any new people. <laughs> 
It took them each about, it took each of them about 25 seconds to cross 90 degrees of the horizon before performing another right angle turn westward toward downtown Los Angeles. We estimated their diameter at 30 feet and their speed to be 1,700 miles an hour. Must be a sport model. Each appeared as an intense electric blue light, round and without length. They moved with the motion of flat stones skipping across a smooth pond. Evaluation. Sounds fun. Here's the evaluation of the event. No no natural or optical phenomenon makes the peculiar light in bright day attributed to these objects by Sullivan and his colleagues, nor can any natural object hurtling at such speed execute a right angle turn. So there. As in the Moore Theodolite sighting, the execution of such a turn would have crushed any human crew under the impact of the G-forces. Finally, of course, no known machine travels at 1,700 miles per hour without making a sound or leaving an exhaust or vapor trail. Well, we have aircraft that do that now. Well, yeah, but they didn't in the 50s. Remember back in the day, they thought 80, well, I think early in this, in our discussion a couple episodes ago, they talked about before the trains came, they thought 85 miles an hour, the same thing would happen. You'd liquefy your body. <laughs> yeah, how things have changed. Now, you've probably, how's the fastest you've ever driven? I've had each of my cars up pretty close to 100. That's it? Yeah. You haven't gone, you know, I don't want to break anything. Incident number five. On January 20th, 1951, at 8.30 p.m., Captain Lawrence W. Vinther of Mid-Continent Airlines was ordered by the control tower at the Sioux City Airport to investigate a very bright light above the field. He took off in his DC-3 with his co-pilot, James F. Buckmeyer, and followed the light. Always follow the light. All at once, the light dived at oh. the DC-3, almost head on. It passed silently and at great speed, about 200 feet above its nose. Both pilots wrenched their heads back to see where it had gone, only to discover that the thing had somehow reversed direction in a split second and was now flying parallel to the airliner, about 200 feet away, heading in the same direction. How would you like that? One That's point? freaky. You have nowhere to hide. You're in an airplane. What are we going to do? Run. <laughs> it was a clear moonlight night, and both men got a good look at the object. It was as big or, as, or bigger than a B-29, had a cigar-shaped fuselage, and a glider type wing set well forward without sweep back and without engine nacelles, I don't know what that is, or jet pods. That's the, you know, when you're flying in an aircraft and it's wing, uh, the engines are underneath the wings. Okay. There's like a pod that's in a cell. Okay. There was no exhaust glow. The white light appeared to be recessed at the bottom of the plane. After a few seconds, the object lost altitude, passed under the DC 3, and disappeared. A civilian employee of Air Intelligence was a passenger on the flight, saw the object, and confirms the description by the pilots. Evaluation. I always get to be the... You're you the know, evaluation person. Because be you're, the, you're the one that the doubter. gets to tell. Not necessarily. I think these things have proven that they don't exactly know what they are. The conditions for observation were excellent. One fact alone, the astonishing reversal of direction performed by the object suffices to classify it as a device far beyond the known capabilities of aeronautical science. Although its shape is different, the soundlessness of the object and the absence of observable means of propulsion relate it to the saucer class of phenomenon. And then there's incident six. On January 29th, 1952, just before midnight, a B-29 was on a solo mission over Wonsan, South Korea. North. Excuse me, I, I know. The nice Korea. North Korea. <laughs> nice Korea. <laughs> These are the mean Koreas. It was flying at a speed somewhat less than 200 miles per hour, an altitude of somewhat, somewhat above, above 20,000 feet. Simultaneously, the tail gunner and the fire control man in the waist saw a bright round ar object in the sky. It's orange. Sorry, I missed the orange object in the sky late, huh? near the plane. <laughs> I'm tired. Both said it was about three feet in diameter, flew with the revolving motion on a course parallel to theirs, and wore a halo of bluish flame. It also appeared to pulsate. Must have been a boombox. The object followed the B-29 for about five minutes, then pulled ahead and shot away at a sharp angle. On the same night, a similar globe was seen by the tail gunner. 
and waste gunner of another B-29 80 miles away over Sun Chom. But flying at about the same height, the globe followed the plane for about a minute, then disappeared. Evaluation. Theoreticians in the Air Force believe the fireballs were not natural phenomenon, but propelled objects. They bear some similarity to the balls of so-called fireball fighters or foo fighters, which flew wing on allied aircraft over Germany and Japan during 1944 and 45 and have never been satisfactorily explained. Yeah, there's some speculation that, in addition to that, that Germany had developed um, the Foo Fighters, which is that glowing ball mm -hmm. phenomenon that it was they use it for reconnaissance. But it's Dave I Grohl. don't think that ever, I don't know if that ever really. That's Dave Grohl's band. What's that, Foo Fighters? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, in the Korean incidents, the fireballs seem, on the evidence, their sharp acceleration, their blue light, and the abrupt angular swerve to resemble the saucers described earlier. Incident number seven. On the night of November 2nd, 1951, a ball of Kelly Green fire, larger than the moon and blazing several times more brightly, yes. flashed eastward across the skies of Arizona. It raced straight as a bullet, parallel to the ground, and then exploded in a frightful paroxysm of light without making a sound. At least 165 people saw the incredible thing. Hundreds more witnessed the similar flight of countless other fireball, fireballs that since December 1945 have bathed the hills of the Southwest in their lunar glare. Wow. I didn't... In the last year, they have seen been seen as far afield as Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Puerto Rico. Reports came so thick and fast during 1948 that in 1949, the Air Force established Project Twinkle to investigate them. That is... I know. That's a great name. <laughs> the worst name. <laughs> I, it still looks like Twinkie to me. I don't know. I just... Project Twinkie. That is Twinkle. I did, they're sitting around a table, a bunch of generals. All right, what are we going to name this? How about Twinkle? And all of them agree. I don't know. Maybe somebody had to pee and said, I have to tinkle. I don't, I don't know. Let's name it Twinkle. Yeah, or a private did it and it's changed it or something, just as a prank. Anyway, Project Twinkle established a triple photo theodolite post at Vaughn, North Mexico, to obtain a scientific data on the fireballs. Day in, or excuse me, day and night, week in, week out, for three months, a crew kept vigil, ironically, while fireballs continued flashing everywhere else in the south, west. They saw nothing until the project was transferred to Holloman Air Base in Alamogordo, New Mexico, North Mexico. Therefore, there, during the three month, another three-month siege, they saw a few but were unable to make satisfactory computations because of the fireballs' great speed. Search parties have had no better luck. <laughs> they have combed in vain the countryside beneath the point of disappearance. Not a trace of telltale substance has been found on the ground. Oh, here's my evaluation. Yeah, what's your evaluation, I'm going to Deb? evaluate now. Yeah, what's the evaluation, Deb? The popular Southwest belief that a strange meteor shower was underway has been blasted, blasted, I say, by Dr. Lincoln La Paz, mathematician, astronomer, and director of the Institute at Meteorites at the University of New Mexico. Hmm. Looks like La Paz points out that normal fireballs do not appear green. Yeah. They, f <laughs> <laughs> they fall in the trajectory forced on them by gravity and are generally as noisy as a freight train and leave meteorites where they hit. The green New Mexican species does none of those things, neither do the green fireballs appear to be electrostatic phenomena they move too regularly and too fast oh yeah whatever sure if the fire <laughs> if the fireballs if the fireballs are the product of a united states weapons project as some southwesterners believe it is a very secret one indeed because i don't know about it the this... atomic energy commission and every other government agency connected with weapons development has denied to life any responsibility for the fireballs oh well if they denied it then they ain't got it yeah yeah could they be self-destroying Russians' reconnaissance devices? I think self-destructing. Um, not likely. While the United States believes the Russians have an intercontinental guided missile, there is no intelligence that indicates that they have developed silent power plants or objects capable of moving nearly as fast as meteors. 
12 miles per second. 12 miles per second, I knew that. Yet, for whatever it may be worth, the only reports of green fireballs prior to 1945 came from the Baltic area. The extreme greenness of the fireballs has impressed Greece. most witnesses. <laughs> They're so green. When asked to indicate the it's approximate color. color on a spectrum chart, most of them have touched the band at 5,200 angstroms, which is close to the green of burning copper. I've never burned copper, but, you know. Copper is almost never found in meteorites. Oh, then why would they be green? The friction of the air oxidizes shortly after the meteor enters the upper atmosphere. However, a curious fact has been recorded by aerologists. Concentrations of copper particles are now present in the air of Arizona and New Mexico, particularly in the fireball areas. These were not encountered in air samples made before 1948. Oh, that's, that's crazy. These seven incidents are reprinted with the kind permission of the editors of Time and Life International which was published May 5th of 1952, copyright Time, Inc., with acknowledgments to H.B. Derek Jr. and Robert Ginna. A required statement. Yeah, sure. They care what we say. <laughs> I, know, I don't think they're around anymore. In 1934, I was at school in the south of England. Did Were you know you? that? Wow. <laughs> you look so good for your age. And one November evening after lights out, our dormitory was suddenly lit by a brilliant green glare. With yells of delight, we rushed to the windows in time to see an immense green fireball move slowly across the sky and disappear behind the Sussex Downs. Oh, my God. Did you go out and look at it? It was so bright that all the school grounds were lit up in this unearthly green glow. The walls of a white cottage half a mile away reflected the light almost as brightly as a green neon sign. Our speculations, however, were interrupted by the appearance of an angry master who had come to investigate the commotion. Get your little butt back in bed. I'm trying to go and wake me up one more time. The master. That's right. It's not the headmaster. Yeah, it's an angry master. I'm sure there, <laughs> there were a lot of them and a headmaster. Wow, the phenomena as reported in these recent incidents, as recent as when the yeah. book was written in the 50s. Yeah. Uh, are not new. In 1619, Christopher Scheer, prefect yeah. of a Swiss canton, wrote to a friend, I guess that's Friar Kircher, uh -huh. and he has the address. Which... Yeah, well, let's, let's <laughs> see if he's still there. <laughs> Having remained on the balcony to contemplate the perfect purity of the firmament, I saw a fiery, shining dragon rise from one of the caves on Mount Politis. Pilatus, Pilatus, I have no idea. And direct himself rapidly towards Flulen to the other end of the lake. Enormous in size, his and tail more. was longer and his neck stretched out. He was enormous in size. In flying, he emitted on his way numerous sparks. I thought at first I was seeing a meteor, but soon looking more attentively, I was convinced by his flight that I saw a veritable, 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 veritable dragon. Did fiery flying dragons really exist in Switzerland during the 17th century? Or did the prefect, while contemplating the purity of the firmament, see something similar to the objects disturbing our skies today? I don't think what he do saw you a think, dragon. Deb? Was what? there marijuana in the 1600s? <laughs> Morphine. What is the strange attraction of our planet? Is it a kind of cosmic beauty spot? A freak? A curiosity? A solar Niagara Falls. Those, those lure tourists and sightseers from all over the universe. Not in ones and twos, but in hundreds of thousands. Streams of mysterious object flowed through space for six days on end. Wow. Processions clogged the highways around our globe that would make the holiday main roads seem empty by comparison. The 19th century was a record season for stellar tourists. Millions of extraterrestrial beings apparently peered, probed, 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 <laughs> probed, gaped at, and recorded our planet as they cruised by on their mammoth outings. Well, this guy's got quite an imagination. Wow. In September of 1851, a clergyman and amateur astronomer named Reed reported that he saw through his telescope a host of luminous bodies passing by very high up. 
Some move swiftly, others slowly. Most of them move from east to west, while others moved off towards the south. The whole fantastic cascade went on for six hours, flight after flight, thousand upon thousand. He calculated several hundred per minute as the entire fleet of another system was on maneuvers in the stratosphere we like to think of as our own. Wow, this is getting freaky. C.B. Chalmers, F-R-A-S, whatever that is, commenting, said he had seen a similar procession, but that the bodies he had seen appeared to be oval in shape. This was probably due to the angle at which they had been observed. From directly below, a disk would appear circular. From an acute angle, they would resemble ellipses. On April, 20, okay, we're going backwards in time here, but I, I guess these are more detailed observations. Yeah. Um, 27 April, 1863, Henry Waldner saw a similar procession, which he reported to Dr. Wolf of the Zurich, Zurich Observatory, who told him that a similar performance had been witnessed by Sen Senior, is it still Senior? Senior. Capocci of the oh, Cap <laughs> Capodimonte <laughs> Observatory in Naples on 11 May 1845. On August 8th in 1849 at 3 p.m. in Ge Guise, Switzerland, a Mr. Inglis sees thousands of luminous disks stream by for 25 minutes continuously. His servant, who had better eyesight, <laughs> said he saw a corona or luminous fuzziness around them. Then in India, eight, uh, October 18th, 17th and 18th, the sun was being observed by Lieutenant Herschel at Bangalore. Into his field of vision came a stream of small dark objects silhouetted against the sun. When they had moved past the orb, they appeared as luminous dots or disks. Herschel tried different focusings with his telescope that suggested the objects to be very high up. I guess we're just we're going over... Um... Multiple sighting yeah. uh, experiences. They're breaking that. He's breaking that out again. This is, um, you know, George Adamski. You know, George Adamski's book, and they're he's again. We're just doing. We're doing the history and the. Well, we're doing the history of the observation recordings. Okay. We're not even sure of what really happened. Yeah, we right? have no idea. We didn't see it, but that's of every observation, right? He thought he saw a corona or fuzziness around them, but he could not be sure. And that's today there's I've got someone at work who actually has seen a UFO and he says it came over him at probably 100, 150 miles an hour. He was in L he lived in LA at the time and he said it was it was the same thing. It was he said it was only a couple hundred feet up. Mm -hmm. But it was it was kind of blurry. It was almost like it was blurry and that's the cloak. Yeah, it's electromagnetic. Well it's the field. That allows it, you know, that allows it to, you know, fly at those, as at those speed, and at gravity, basically. And however it's moving forward, we don't really know yet, right? Um, one paused obligingly for him to inspect it thoroughly. He noticed some kind of exhaust or wispy appendage. Then it shot off with a sudden burst of speed. There was nothing very strange about this marathon stream except... That went on and on for two whole days. That's bizarre. Across to Mexico, the Observatory of Zacatas, Mexico, on 12 August 1883, M. Bonilla is taking telescopic photos of the sun when the show commences. A large stream of glowing bodies begins to cross the sun's disk diagonally, taking between three to four seconds to complete the transit. Miss M. Bonilla watched them for an hour before the clouds hid the sun. He looked again the next day on August 13th, and to his amazement, the procession was still in progress. When seen against the sun, the objects appeared as small dark ovals with five ray-like projections. One paused and hovered for a few seconds, enabling Benia to obtain a photo, which is possibly the first photo of a flying saucer ever taken. <sighs> I eventually traced a copy of this photo to an attic in Paris and made a special journey to see it. Unfortunately, it was old and faded, and attempts to reproduce it were not successful. Benilla telegraphed the observatory in Mexico City to have a look. They caught, replied that they could see them, but that to them that they appeared... 
what the hell, a little, <laughs> um, a little way from the sun, owing to a parallax. I guess they've seen these things. This is, I thought they were talking about the picture, but the picture story is kind of done. Uh, doubtless, this enabled them to calculate the height by triangulation, but Bonilla says ambiguously that they were relatively near to the Earth, which he qualifies with less than the distance to the moon. I suppose the astronomers... 240,000 odd miles is relatively near. Okay. Senor Rico of Palermo Observatory saw straight lines of similar objects slowly cross the sun on 30th, 30 November to 1880 at 8.30 a.m. From the data and calculations given, it is evidence that these things were flying very high. One of the best processions took place on uh, September 21st in 1910 for three hours without pause. Flights of round, shiny things streamed across New York City. Traffic was held up, and people thronged the streets to gaze at them. Possibly about a million people saw them on that occasion. Wow, that's, that's a lot of people. But why, we ask, out of all that host, did not one more enterprising than the rest come down and land? We can only conclude that our planet has a bad name in the stellar yearbooks and travel brochures, like those signs on the roads running through jungles, which caution tourists not to tarry nor leave the safety of their cars. Warning, do not land on Earth. The natives, natives are dangerous. Stop press. Yeah. Since the above was written, Boris de Rakowitz, well, we'll butcher that, Rakowitz, was has found this ancient Egyptian saucer among the papers of the late Professor Alberto Tulli, former director of the Egyptian section of the Vatican Museum. The Vatican Museum is, I don't know if this was at the museum, but Grush, the, mm -hmm. I know you don't listen to the, didn't listen to the Rogan thing, but he alluded to the fact the Vatican had the earliest, um, one of the earlier, I don't say the earliest, um, flying saucers or UAPs. Mm -hmm. It's like 20 feet round, and the Vatican, it would crash there at some point. And the Vatican, um, Italy, it crashed in Italy, and then um, they couldn't figure out what it was, and they thought it was a German, one of those German experimental aircraft. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they called Germany and said, is Come this one of yours? And they get over there and go, that's nah, not ours. <laughs> So they studied the thing, and then it ultimately ended up, at, I believe, at the Vatican, or but it ultimately ended up here in the U.S. Well, not at the house, but it ended up in the U.S. It's not here? No. Well, there's a lot of things in this house. It could be here somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I keep finding new things all the time. It is a fragment from the royal annals, annals of uh, Thuthmosis III, circa 1504 to 1450 B.C., and when translated, it reads as follows, Oh, Deb. great. I get there this. There you go. In the year 22, third month of winter, sixth hour of the day, the scribes of the house of life found it was a circle of fire that was coming in the sky, though it had no head. The breadth of its mouth had a foul odor, its body one rod, about 150 feet long and one rod large. It had no voice. Now, after some days had passed over these things, lo, they were more numerous than anything. They were shining in the sky more than the sun to the limits of heaven. Powerful was the position of the fire circles. The army of the king looked on, and his majesty was in the midst of it. It was after supper. Thereupon they, the fire circles, went up higher, directed towards the south. Many cases of an unusual odor, possibly due to ionization or to actual waste products of the saucers, will be found in the later chapter. Waste products, chapter 15. <laughs> <laughs> notice we'll also run across that. that. Notice also that the circles had no voice, i.e. they were silent. Acknowledgement for the above is made to Tiffany Thayer, editor of Doubt, and to Boris Rashwiltz for his translation. Okay, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. We're running into chapter three. Okay. We thought we were going to be able to finish this. I can't believe it took me so long to prepare that. It only took us this long to get through it. So, um, again, you know, thanks for uh, listening to the latest episode of the Alien Probe Podcast. 
We welcome comments, questions, or requests to alienprobepodcast at gmail.com. Visit us, on, visit us on Facebook. Check out our website, alienprobe.net. Twitter and Instagram at alienprobepod. Like and subscribe, Deb. Yes. YouTube, sir. Alien Probe Podcast. Check us out at Patreon. Um, we've got some episodes thrown up there. Uh, thanks again, Deb, for uh, joining Thank the you. podcast. And um, we will see you next week and watch the skies. 